Hi everyone, my name is uh, Dr. Mark Olfert and I am a respiratory physiologist. I've been asked to give you a lecture on uh, the lung and how the lung works. A little bit about myself before I begin. Uh, I was a respiratory therapist, in fact I still am, uh, but I don't work in the hospital anymore. Um, but I worked for about eight years as a respiratory therapist in a neonatal intensive care unit in a children's hospital helping to take care of uh, babies uh, that needed mechanical ventilation and needed help breathing. Uh, this was before I became a scientist and now that I'm a medical scientist uh, I get to and have been involved with uh, many fun projects including the picture that you see on the screen right here where I've had a chance to fly on a NASA research aircraft and collect data in uh, zero gravity. So the purpose for this lecture that we're going to talk about is to give you a little bit of background and to be able to answer a little bit of background about the lung and to be able to answer these three questions. By the end, you should be able to say and know how we breathe, why we breathe, and why we breathe faster during exercise or when we go up to high altitude and what happens uh, to the airway or to people when they have uh, asthma and they have an asthma attack. So let's just begin with some interesting facts about the lung that, that will also help in our understanding of how the lung works. The first thing to know is that the lung is a delicate organ. It's interesting in that it is both strong but yet also very very fragile and a good analogy for this is what you see on your screen, uh, and that is uh, nylon stockings. So you guys might not be too familiar with this, but the girls in the room certainly are. Nylon material is actually really strong. If you were to take a bowling ball and put it in a pair of nylons, it would support it and hold it, no problem. But at the same time, uh, nylon is also very fragile, and uh, just a tiny little nick or tear will cause it to run and uh, impair the integrity and the ability for, for it to function. Uh, another actually really good example, because this is a closer example to what the way the, our lung is, is a beehive. Beehives are also both strong and fragile, and you can see this in this picture in that a beehive can contain many, many pounds of honey. So it has strength to hold all that weight, but yet uh, if you take your hand or, or a tool you could easily damage the uh, the walls of the uh, uh, of the hive, and in fact, the lung is very much like a beehive in that when we get to the very end of the lungs, we have uh, this unit called the alveoli that are structured very much like the beehive, where you have individual cells and they're all interconnected, and it's a, it's this interconnected nature of the walls to each other, while any while any one unit itself is extremely fragile and uh, wouldn't be able to support itself. The fact that we have all these walls connected to each other like uh, the same way that a beehive is adds the strength to the, uh, uh, to the organ itself and to the lung. But yet uh, it's still fragile uh, in that uh, dam it is easily damaged and this can then impair uh, how the lung will work. Another interesting fact about the lung is it is the only organ to get the entire cardiac output. Now that's in, with the exception of the heart. Of course the heart is the pump and so it, it has to receive all the blood. But there's no other organ outside of the heart that receives the entire cardiac output or all the blood. All the other organs only get a, a fraction of the total cardiac output that goes around the body. And this is actually very important. It's an important distinction and feature for the lung because the primary function and purpose of the lung is to participate in gas exchange. And by gas exchange, we mean to allow oxygen to come in from the atmosphere, bring it into the lung, and then into the blood, and then for carbon dioxide to move out of the lung. And we're going to talk more about carbon dioxide and why that's there and why we need to remove it. <coughs> So the lung, turns out the volume in a lung is about four to seven liters, which is pretty close to uh, the volume in a basketball, something all of you are, I'm sure, familiar with. And so I like to use this analogy because uh, our lungs in the basketball, although they have roughly the same volumes, 
they are very, very different in terms of the surface area uh, that they have. So if you remember from math class how to calculate the area of a sphere, it's simply pi times the diameter squared. Average basketball is uh, nine, almost nine and a half inches, 9.4 inches. We're going to use meters here, so that I simply converted this to 0.24 meters. And so if we calculate the surface area uh, of a basketball, it's about 0.18 meters squared. But look at the lung. The lung has an extremely large surface area. In fact, uh, depending on your lung size and how big your lung is really depends on how tall you are. The taller you are, the larger the lung volume you'll have. But the lung has an extremely large surface area. And in fact, uh, if you were to take all the individual lung cells and lay them next to each other side by side, you would fill up about half the size of a tennis court, which has uh, an area uh, just under 100 uh, meters squared. So even though the, a basketball and our lungs are roughly the same total volume, the surface area for gas exchange and for gas is vastly different. And in fact, this is a, an important feature of the lung that allows it to do what it needs to do and to function uh, for what we need. So how do you get this large surface area in such a small volume? Well, in order to understand that, we need to uh, take a step back and let's just make sure we understand a little bit about the anatomy uh, in our lungs. So in fact, the lung is actually only one component of our respiratory system. The respiratory system is, includes the upper airways, which is uh, the mouth and the nose, and we call these the naso and oropharynx. And a very important structure in the upper airway is this uh, flap. It's called an epiglottis. This flap closes down over the top of the trachea so that when you eat or when you uh, drink that uh, you have a protective cover, a lid, if you will, that blocks the airway so that the food goes down the esophagus and down to the stomach where it's supposed to be. Uh, sometimes this uh, doesn't work as it should and it will get air uh, or we'll get liquid and food in our airways, and of course this is what happens when someone uh, starts choking. So the epiglottis is a very important function of the upper airway and helps in, uh, keep the integrity uh, of, of the, uh, the airway. When we get into the lung itself, the lung <coughs> has airways. The first main stem, one single branch that comes down is what we call the trachea. The trachea then branch off into uh, airways that we call bronchi and then as you go further and further and deeper into the lung they're called bronchioles and eventually we get down to alveoli. We're going to talk more about alveoli in just a minute but let me just finish uh, with some of this basic anatomy. In our picture here we also have these uh, red lines, these lines that I've highlighted red that show you that we have lobes to our lungs. So you, the way you can think about this is the right lung has three lobes. Think of the right lung as three different balloons. These are distinct um, areas of the lung that get distinct airflow. So there's no mixing between the upper, the middle, and, and the lower lobes. Uh, just like you would have with three different balloons, if you will. Turns out the left side only has two lobes. And the reason for that is that the heart sits predominantly left shifted inside the chest and so the middle lobe for the uh, left lung doesn't get a chance to develop during growth and development uh, because the heart sits here while the heart's somewhat in the middle of the chest most of it actually is left shifted uh, to this side and then uh, the last thing about the lung that is important for you to know is that the lung is not fixed to the chest wall in fact it uh, it moves freely against the inside the chest of the inside the chest and this is what we call a pleural space so you can see that if we zoom in on the on this wall portion right here you can see the arrows are pointing to the pleural space here's the chest wall these are ribs these are muscles that are between the ribs and then here's the lung itself and so the lung is able to freely move um, when it inflates and when it deflates uh, within the chest wall and then the last and an important component uh, of the respiratory system is are the respiratory muscles. Now the main muscle of respiration is the diaphragm. 
In fact, the diaphragm is a dome-shaped muscle that sits at the, on the bottom, on the underside of the lung. It separates the chest from the abdominal cavity. And this is the main muscle of respiration. But there are other muscles. In fact, I pointed out that there's muscles here between the ribs. These are called the intercostal muscles. Uh, so these will also help with, uh, with respiration. But they're smaller muscles, and they don't do near as much of the work as the diaphragm. The diaphragm does a lot of the work. And then there are other muscles uh, on the outside of the chest um, and in the neck that can also help to move the chest and assist with respiration uh, and breathing if it becomes really labored or hard. But it's not something that we normally use every day. And so I referred to uh, the alveoli um, that are at the end of the lung. And the alveoli is where gas exchange takes place. And, uh, and we asked the question, how do we get uh, such a large surface area um, that's half the size of a tennis court? Well, the answer is we have about 600 million of these alveoli in, in an average lung. And the diameter of these alveoli, they're really small, they're about 0.2 millimeters, so the, they're, they're different sizes for sure, uh, but the average diameter is about 0.2 millimeters. So if we take the same formula that we use for the basketball and take the area of a sphere, we can take pi times, now I simply converted the 0.2 millimeters into meters so that we can talk about the same units. So 0.2 millimeters is 0 0.0002 meters squared times the 600 million of these alveoli that we have, and you can see that we can uh, mathematically calculate this large surface area uh, that we have in the lung. So that's how we can have uh, such a large surface area is these uh, collection of all these small uh, alveoli that line the entire periphery of and, and our entire lung. So if we ask the question now, how do we breathe? I need to give you just a little bit more information uh, to explain that. So to understand how we breathe, you need to know that we have areas in the brainstem that we call respiratory centers. And where these respiratory centers are located is in an area called, this is a really cool name, the medulla oblongata. It's this red area of the brainstem. And within the medulla, uh, there are neurons that, we, that are called dorsal, the dorsal respiratory group and the ventral respiratory group. Now, dorsal and ventral sound like real fancy names, but uh, really they're just ana anatomical terms to say the back and the front. And uh, an easy way to remember dorsal is if uh, you guys may have heard of uh, the dorsal fin on a on a shark or on a whale or a dolphin, right? So this is the fin that's on its back, the dorsal fin. So dorsal refers to the back side and ventral re re refers to the front side. So we have these neurons on the back side of the medulla and on the front side. And the ones in the DRG, the dorsal group, act like a pacemaker. So they are constantly creating an electrical signal and this is what's responsible for our everyday automatic breathing. We don't have to think about taking our next breath. Or when we're sleeping, we don't have to think about breathing because our body automatically does that because of the neurons, uh, these pacemaker neurons that are in the dorsal respiratory group, the DRG. And then the ventral uh, respiratory group acts like an off switch. So think of the DRG as the on switch, constantly turning on the signal, and the ventral group uh, acting to turn it off, and these ping pong back and forth between each other to send the signals uh, to, uh, to stimulate breathing. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in, an, in a few upcoming slides here. But I, I just want to point out, these are not the only respiratory centers. There are other centers uh, in our body. In fact, there are other centers in the medulla, but then we also have uh, responses uh, in, in our brain. For example, you can decide that you want to hyperventilate and breathe faster. And when you do that, you can override the autonomic control and simply hyperventilate because you're choosing to. Well, this is coming from your cortex. This is a uh, higher brain level that overrides that so that you can either hold your breath if you want or you can breathe faster. Uh, temperature and pain will also cause changes in respiration and how you breathe. 
If any of you have jumped into a cold stream, lake, or river, what do you start doing? You start <gasps> gasping, right? You start taking these deep breaths when you hit the cold water. And so there are other parts of the brain, and this is, these are located in the hypothalamus. It's another part of the brain that will actually uh, have an effect on your breathing. The pain centers will also, pain will also stimulate uh, or can stimulate a change in how you breathe. So there are other centers, but the, the, uh, the ones for autonomic control are the uh, DRG and BRG, and we're going to focus on this for the rest of the lecture so we don't have to think about these other ones right now. So what happens from the, uh, the respiratory centers in, in the medulla here, they get sent, the electrical signals that get created get sent down nerves, in fact it's called a phrenic nerve, that goes down to the diaphragm. And when the diaphragm gets the signal, the muscle contracts. And when it contracts, because it has this dome-shaped pattern in our chest, when it contracts, it flattens out. Well, when it flattens out, it also moves the chest wall outward a little bit. And what that does is it increases the volume in your chest. So it makes the volume bigger. By making the volume bigger, it allows, it lowers the pressure inside the lung, and so air comes moving in. And so this cartoon shows you as the diaphragm flattens, air moves in, and then when the diaphragm relaxes and goes back up to its normal position, uh, air will get pushed out. So really this is uh, very similar to what happens with a syringe, if you think about it. When you pull back on the syringe, you're making the volume bigger inside the syringe. And so as you make that volume bigger, the pressure inside gets lower, and so air comes in to equalize. And if you want to push that air out, you make the volume smaller simply by pushing on the back of the syringe. That raises the pressure inside the syringe so that the, the pressure pushes the air out. This is what's happening with our lung every time we're breathe, you breathe. And this is what we call negative pressure ventilation. So we typically breathe by creating this negative pressure in our lung, and that causes air to come flowing in. So this is how we breathe. But if we, af but if we ask the question why we breathe, some of you probably already know the, the answer to that, and that is because we need oxygen, and where we need the oxygen is for every single cell in our body, we need it in the mitochondria. So why do we need it in the mitochondria? In fact, some of you have probably heard of the mitochondria uh, in your biology class referred to as the powerhouse of the cell. Well, we need the mitochondria create ATP. This is the power that the body can actually use. This is what our muscles use. This is uh, that we need for respiration. This is what the heart needs. This is um, every cell in the body needs ATP. This is what allows us to live. So, and mitochondria create ATP by using oxygen, and if, if you don't have oxygen, the mitochondria can't create this ATP, but it takes oxygen and the glucose that we get, uh, and glucose is just a fancy term for the sugars, and the sugars come from the food that we eat, okay? So that we break down the food when we eat it, we break down them into the sugars, and this combination of oxygen and sugars uh, the mitochondria takes that and it uses to create ATP. In the process of doing this, it creates uh, what we call metabolic waste, or it, or it creates a waste product. And, that and those are water and carbon dioxide, or CO2. I don't know if you guys knew this, but did you know that our cells and organs are nearly 70 to 80, uh, 90 percent water? In fact, on average, we have about 75 we're about 75 to 80 percent water and you can see that there's different organs that have different percentages but uh, the vast majority of uh, the composition of our cells and our organs and our entire body is actually water but we're not going to talk about water right now that's just an interesting fact in fact uh, the how water is balanced and what controls water is dealt with a different uh, organ system the kidneys and that's, uh, that's for a different lecture. But we do want to talk about carbon dioxide because what happens with carbon dioxide uh, actually is, a very is very important in terms of uh, how we breathe, why we breathe, and uh, physiologic function, how we function. So if I use a diagram that looks like this, 
you can see we have the lungs, we have the heart and circulation, and then we have uh, every cell in the body, the connection to every cell in the body. And so you can see that the lungs and the heart play a critical role. Um, the lungs bring in oxygen, uh, the heart and blood vessels transport it around the body to our cells where we can deliver the oxygen to the mitochondria. The mitochondria will then uh, um, produce ATP, which the cell needs, and, and uh, in the process of doing that, it'll also produce this water and the CO2. Well, since the CO2 is being produced in every cell, CO2 concentrations are high inside the cell, and they're much lower in the blood because there's not much CO2 out here in the air that we're breathing. And so CO2 is gonna diffuse out of the cell and into the blood it's going to be taken, um, transported via the veins to the lungs and then uh, offloaded into the lungs so we can exhale. So every time we breathe in, two things are happening. We're bringing in oxygen because we need it and we're also getting rid of the CO2 out of our body. And that's actually really important because if CO2 builds up in the body, it can have some negative consequences and negative effects. But CO2 is actually really important because you might think because we need oxygen that this is actually how ventilation is controlled. In order to control ventilation you need sensors that can detect uh, its level and whether you need to increase or decrease. It turns out that we don't breathe based off of the amount of oxygen we have in our system but rather the amount of CO2 that we have in our system. So CO2 is important because these respiratory centers where the signal comes from for the diaphragm to contract also contains these sensors and we call these sensors chemoreceptors. And we have chemoreceptors, uh, we have central chemoreceptors, these are the ones that are in the brain stem, and we actually have uh, what we call peripheral chemoreceptors that are found in the blood vessels. So they're actually found in two spots. They're found in the, the aorta, which is the branch, the aortic arch, which is comes, it's the curved part of the, the large vessel that comes right off of the heart and then starts to go through the body. And then we also have these sensors, uh, these bodies uh, in the, the carotid artery. And these are the arteries that are in the neck and they supply the blood vessels up to the head. So these, these uh, this area, in the blood vessels contain special cells that can sense uh, CO2 uh, and then these are connected with nerves back up to the brain stem so that the body can know the amount of CO2 in the system and if CO2 uh, starts to rise the body can automatically increase ventilation to get rid of more of it or if CO2 levels are falling uh, the body can slow down ventilation so, so that CO2 levels don't go below an, a normal level that we would have. Now, even though the body does not use oxygen as its main stimulus to breathe, it doesn't mean that it can't detect oxygen. And in fact, we're gonna talk about this when we talk about high altitude, and this becomes very important. So, but it's important to, to notice and realize here that the, the sensors for oxygen, the chemoreceptors for oxygen, are only in the peripheral chemoreceptors. They're not in the brainstem where these, where these respiratory centers are. They're only in uh, the arteries in these peripheral chemoreceptors. And it turns out we also have receptors for pH. So if blood pH uh, becomes more acid or becomes more alkaline, um, then, uh, then the body can also respond and alter ventilation appropriately. Normal blood pH is very neutral. It's around 7.4. And if you remember from your general chemistry class, uh, the, range for p the, the range for pH is uh, 0 to 14. So 7 is right in the middle, and 7.4 is a normal blood pH. So this is why we breathe. So if we ask now, why do we breathe faster with exercise? Well, the answer is, in order to exercise, we have to do muscle work. More muscle work means that we need a lot more ATP, and in order to generate more ATP, we need a lot more oxygen. So as the mitochondria start consuming and using a lot more oxygen, they will in turn start producing a lot more CO2. And from what we've just learned, you start producing more CO2, this will get transported uh, through the blood vessel system, and you know that uh, 
we have central and peripheral chemoreceptors that sense CO2. It's not oxygen here that's at play, right? It's just the CO2. Uh, and as you, uh, as you exercise harder and harder and create more and more CO2, ventilation will continue to increase higher and higher and higher because you're constantly providing this CO2, this input and this, the signal from carbon dioxide to these respiratory centers in the brainstem that then are going to drive ventilation. Now, you, we, with heavy exercise, we also can have uh, changes in pH. Some of you have, may have heard of the term lactate. And lactate is something that happens with anaerobic metabolism. And so uh, that will cause a lactic acidosis when you start producing that. And so when you get to heavy exercise, the pH in your blood can change and can also further increase uh, ventilation. But the primary signal that's happening, especially early and with light exercise, is the fact that we're producing more carbon dioxide. So what happens with high altitude? Well, as a scientist, I've also had the privilege of uh, being involved in experiments uh, around the world. Uh, this is one example where I was able to spend several weeks uh, in the Andes Mountains in Peru. And I was part of a team of scientists that were studying the effects of uh, gas exchange and exercise in these high altitude natives uh, in, uh, in South America. And so this is a picture of me at an altitude of 15,700 uh, feet. And I know that because uh, I actually have a watch that has a barometer on it or an altimeter. And so I can tell what altitude I'm at. And you can see in the watch I'm at about 4,800 meters. We also have these uh, nice little devices called pulse oximeters that we can just stick in our fingers and it tells us our oxygen saturation. And a normal oxygen saturation, that's this top number right here, the bottom number is the heart rate, my heart rate. A normal oxygen saturation is 98 to 100%. So you can see I'm at, I'm at 77%. This is well below normal. And my normal heart rate's around 70 or 75 and my heart rate's high. Well, this is very normal for a healthy person uh, at altitude. But if you had uh, this saturation at sea level, uh, you would be, they would be taking you to the hospital and you'd likely be in an ICU pretty quickly because our body shouldn't normally be at this level. But with high altitude, uh, this is actually fairly, uh, th this is normal and we're going to talk about why here in just a second. Does anyone know where the tallest mountain in our in the continental mainland USA is? Some of you might guess that it would be in uh, the Rocky Mountains, and that would be a, a good guess. That there are some very tall peaks there. Uh, some of you might think that it would be in the Cascades uh, up here in Washington. Mount Rainier is pretty tall, but in fact, the tallest mountain is uh, Mount Whitney, and it's in the Sierra Nevadas in California, 14,500 uh, feet. Uh, just for comparison, for any of you from the East Coast or in West Virginia, uh, the, Appalachian, the tallest mountains in the entire Appalachian range is uh, not even close to half of what these are, only, only around 6,600 uh, feet. And so I, I bring this up because uh, uh, the altitude that I'm at is nearly 1,000 feet higher than what's the, uh, the highest point in, in the mainland U.S. And there are people who... Uh, who live and work at these altitudes uh, their entire lives. In fact, this is what we refer to them as high altitude natives. And so this is one of the reasons why uh, I was in Peru, so we could study these individuals and how they adapt and how they survive um, at this high altitude, especially with oxygen levels being this low. Now, for, for, the, for these individuals, they are actually not this low because there are mechanisms that we have uh, that allow them to adapt and, and um, raise their saturation level and, and in, increase that over time. But that takes time with acclimatization. So what's happening to uh, what, what you already know with how we breathe? What's happening at high altitude? Well, at high altitude, because we have a low level of oxygen, uh, the higher we go, the barometric pressure is lower, 
And so that means the amount of oxygen that gets pushed over into our lung by diffusion is, is lower. And this is where these oxygen sensors become really important. So now the body is not relying on CO2. Even though CO2 is the normal uh, control, the everyday control, if, if the body senses that oxygen levels have fallen, then uh, the O2 sensors can take over from CO2 and can drive uh, ventilation. In fact, that's what happens when we go to high altitude. Uh, these O2 sensors, and it's important to realize the O2 sensors are only in the peripheral chemoreceptors. They're not uh, in the central, but the signals are sent from the peripheral chemoreceptors up to the brainstem where the neurons that control uh, the electrical signals to the diaphragm and set the rate of breathing can then increase the respiratory rate. So the O2 sensors in the peripheral chemoreceptor are the ones that are driving ventilation with high altitude. And as you breathe faster, your blood pH will also change, and this can also have an influence and affect uh, your ventilation. So whether you're exercising or whether you're at high altitude, you're using uh, different parts of the same mechanism that allow you to control uh, ventilation and, and how fast that you're breathing. But the net effect is still going to be the same, and that is with exercise or high altitude, you're going to breathe faster and you're going to breathe harder because you want to increase the amount of oxygen supply available to the mitochondria so it can use it to create the ATP it needs uh, to meet the demands it's required. So the last question that uh, we, we posed was, um, what happens with someone who has asthma uh, and what happens to their airway? And why, uh, why with asthma um, is it hard to breathe? So to understand that, let's just go back um, and look at the airways like we saw at the beginning of the lecture. But now let's also add in the histology. Let's look at some of the cells and some of the features that actually make up the airway as we go from the trachea all the way down to the alveoli. So the first thing to note is in these upper airways we have these blue areas. These are cartilage. And the cartilage around these uh, large upper airways are very important because they help to splint and to keep the airways open. It makes them harder to uh, uh, it makes them very strong, uh, adds some, uh, it basically adds uh, like a, um, think of a steel band that would be going over a, a flexible tube and it adds some structure and rigidity to make it uh, stiff and very hard to collapse. And so with asthma, the problem is not in these upper airways because the cartilage is, is there and that helps to support the airway. If you look at all these levels though, there's something in common and that is that you see that there's smooth muscle there's, and there's a lot of smooth muscle here, smooth muscle and then when we get all the way down to the alveoli you have no smooth muscle and that's very important because this is where gas exchange is taking place so you want this to be as thin as possible so this is a really thin barrier. For asthma the problem comes in this area where we don't have the cartilage. We have smooth muscle and we can also even have uh, the, uh, the problem in, in this area as well, but primarily it occurs in the bronchioles where the smooth muscles, if they contract, they can narrow and constrict these, uh, these airways. So you, uh, in this area you simply have smooth muscle and then the single layer of cells that line and make up the, uh, the, the airway. So if we look at a cross section of an airway, here's, the, here's a normal air, airway with the smooth muscle that's around it going all the way down to the alveoli. So think this is a bronchial. Well during an asthma attack what's happening is the, uh, the smooth muscles contract. And by contracting they're going to make, uh, they're going to squeeze down on the airway which is going to make it narrow. And the other thing that happens with asthma is you typically get inflammation. And so this inflammation then will thicken uh, this wall and make this wall thicker. So you have two things that are happening. You have uh, the smooth muscle making the airways narrower and the walls becoming thicker, uh, making the airway much, much narrow compared to the uh, normal airway. 
And so it's extremely difficult to get air in, as well as you start to trap air, the, the little air that does go in, it, it's really hard for it to come out. And you also start uh, produ making mucus, as you can see with this uh, uh, little uh, area right here. And uh, the mucus simply, um, excess mucus starts to accumulate, and that will also tend to make the airways narrower. And for someone who has uh, frequent asthma attacks, they, even when they're not having an asthma attack, their airways tend to then not be completely normal. They tend to be abnormal. Because of this inflammation, you, you get a thickened wall, and so, and they, and this will cause the airways to be uh, more reactive to um, even small uh, events, but uh, under resting conditions, they may not feel uh, like they're having trouble, but if they try and start to exercise or if they need to breathe faster, then they start to uh, have a, a more difficulty. So, and that's even, that's even when they're not having uh, the actual asthma attack itself. So this is the main problem for someone who has asthma. And it, so the question that uh, some people have is, well then what causes asthma attack? Well there are many things that can cause an asthma attack. Uh, and it's, it's, our, it's the body's reaction to, and these are the 10 most common um, reasons why people have asthma attacks, which often ends up being uh, infections, uh, airway infections, so a cold or a flu, um, dust, air pollution. Uh, some people have um, uh, a reaction to pollens from plants or trees. Uh, in some people, exercise. They don't normally have uh, um, asthma, but uh, when they start to exercise, they'll start to get, uh, uh, it'll be more and more difficult to breathe. Vaping and smoking. So you can see there's a long list here. Even stress and anxiety can uh, stimulate asthma attack in, uh, in, in some people. And so this is a very, uh, it's, it's a very uh, stressful and life-threatening event when someone has an asthma attack because the problem is they're not getting enough air and oxygen to their cells in their body. They're not getting enough oxygen to the brain, they're not getting enough oxygen to the heart, and if that happens, then uh, um, people can quickly uh, fall unconscious, and an asthma attack can be a life-threatening event. So it's really, it's not a, um, a, a funny situation, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it creates panic when it happens. And the, about the closest that uh, you might be able to sort of understand how that feels like is if you, uh, if you go to the cafeteria, grab a straw, plug your nose and simply try and breathe through that straw for a little bit, that will give you a sensation uh, on how difficult uh, it is to breathe when your airway gets significantly narrowed. People who have asthma um, learn very quickly uh, that uh, the, s the signs and symptoms, um, and they typically include uh, coughing. Um, they might start wheezing, and they can hear wheezing, and they'll know an asthma attack is coming on. Their breathing pattern might change, uh, and they might notice a, a tightness in, in their chest. Uh, the good news is that the treatments we have for, as for asthma are really effective and really good. Uh, the first thing that if people who have asthma learn very quickly is how to avoid the triggers, the things that stimulate the asthma attack. And this is the best thing uh, th that you can do is try not to have it if, if you know what those triggers are. But even if you don't, and even if the asthma attack happens, we have a very effective uh, medications inhalers, which people, uh, they're small, they easily fit in your pocket, they can ca uh, people can carry them around with them, and when they know they're going to have this, uh, this medication helps to dilate and open up the airways and keep them from constricting. One last, uh, one last slide here. Um, in case any of you guys out there uh, do this, and uh, more and more uh, youth are trying uh, e-cigarettes and, and, and trying vaping, um, this it's really concerning because the information that you're being told and the information that you're getting is that uh, vaping is safer than cigarettes uh, or that it's completely safe. And there's a couple problems with that. One, it's simply not true. Two, a single 
Jewel Pod contains as much nicotine as an entire pack of cigarettes. So the real concern that many of us have is that uh, the addiction to nicotine is going to occur much more rapidly and much faster. Most people, when they start smoking, they don't start smoking a pack a day. And so they, the, the, the risk for addiction builds up very slowly. But with Juul and with e-cigarettes, with e the amount of nicotine that you get from a single pod uh, is, is astronomically crazy. Uh, and is going to uh, um, create a, a real significant risk for nicotine addiction, which means you won't be able to quit. And what we've learned since e-cigarettes are first introduced uh, in, in 2004 uh, is that uh, people who vape, just like people who smoke, have a greater risk for lung infections. In fact, that's actually not different than smoking at all. Um, so vaping leads to greater risk of lung infection, and, and if you get an infection, it's often much more severe than if you weren't vaping. Uh, we know that your lung cells, the cells that produce mucus, the cilia, and other cells in the lung uh, function are impaired. There's uh, several studies now that show a risk for greater stroke and clotting events in the body. And my own lab, we've been studying vaping for the last uh, five, six years and we find that uh, when animals are baked uh, for long periods of time, they end up with stiffer arteries and their blood vessel function is impaired. So when blood vessels normally should be opening up and allowing blood flow to the brain and to the muscles when you're exercising, this is not happening properly. So if, if any of you uh, are thinking about vaping or are vaping, I highly recommend that you, uh, you do your best to try and stop. Uh, because this is something that will absolutely affect you. You won't feel the effects now, and you won't even feel it probably five years from now, but when you're in your 30s and 40s and 50s, uh, you will definitely feel the effect. And this is the same thing that happens uh, with cigarette smoking. The effects aren't felt immediately, but it takes a toll on the body, and when you get into uh, later in life, you will definitely have uh, consequences as a result of that. Uh, thank you for listening. Uh, I I hope that uh, you think the lung is as fascinating as, and interesting as I do, and I hope you've learned uh, just a little bit uh, along the way here.